Hi, I'm uh, Bill Squadron. I'm president of Bloomberg Sports, and uh, I just want to really uh, thank Mark Appleman and Vince Gennaro for coming up with this idea for this conference because, and I think they deserve a real round of applause because they thought this up. And it was a great idea when they came to us last year and asked if we would be pleased to join them in Major League Baseball in presenting this. We uh, immediately jumped on it because we thought it'd be a great idea. This is the second year, and I think it's just going to get better and better, but I think that they've done a phenomenal job and we're pleased to be part of it. Um, I'm also delighted that uh, this evening we're able to um, join with Jerry DePoto of the Angels in doing this presentation. What we're going to do is I'm going to do a short demonstration of the Bloomberg Sports Professional Baseball System that most of the major league teams are now using for a variety of their operations, and then turn it over to Jerry, who will talk about how the Angels approach the whole area of analytics and work with our system and work with other pieces uh, to address you know, all the different areas that analytics have a bearing on. Uh, and then we'll both be pleased to take some Q&A. And I can tell you, I guess, uh, as the presenting sponsor, no good deed goes unpunished. But uh, to be given the spot on the program when we're sitting between you guys and the reception and the open bar, um, I don't know how we deserve that. But uh, we'll be very, uh, hopefully, succinct and uh, get to some good question and answer, and then we'll get everybody to the reception. So um, just to give you a quick background, Bloomberg, uh, which as probably most people here know, is the world's leader in financial analytics and providing data and visualizations for, for, for financial professionals, got into the sports business. We're now in our fourth year with the view that what we hoped we could add was to do four sports across the board what we do for the financial markets, which was to provide valuable, useful, engaging, compelling analytics that would take things to another level and give people tools and insights that would really both improve the way they do their operations or in the case of fans and consumers and others, give them something fun. I was really struck by what Joe Posnanski said when he looks at um, a particular play on a field or uh, on a court and he says, I just want to know more. That's really what drives us. And I also have to thank a lot of the people in this room because what also drives us and really inspires, inspires us is a lot of the work that others in this field do. It gives us ideas. We work with a lot of the people in this room and we view this as a sort of moving picture all the time. The technology changes, the ideas change, and we're constantly looking to upgrade and improve and we welcome all the input we get. Uh, from people in this room uh, and from others, and it helps us to figure out ways to make our systems better. Um, before I jump in and show you the system that we're providing to most of the major league clubs, I do want to point out something we've just launched, which I've put up on the board here. This is a new site that we've really dedicated to the whole area of analytics. It's almost like if you're a fan of what Nate Silver does, we're trying to make this applicable to all sports, and we have a whole team of analysts and writers who spend every day looking at data, looking at statistics, analyzing it, and creating content around it. This is just one example of some um, of a retrospective on 2012's best pitches. But this is a new site within the bsports.com area called statsinsights.com. We only just launched it a couple of months ago, but it's already getting a lot of traffic and a lot of people picking up the, the uh, stories that we're doing. We're also going to be opening it up to, to other writers from outside, so we'd encourage all of you. Obviously, people in this room, more than most people in the world, are looking at data and thinking about different insights to draw from it. We'd love to talk to you about potentially writing for it, but we hope this grows bigger and better across all sports and really brings out, for both the fun and insight of it, all the different um, perspectives on uh, data and analytics and sports. So we're excited about that. The other thing we're quite excited about is we're really focusing a great deal on what we call predictive analytics. We actually started with baseball and with several of the baseball broadcasting networks last year we were doing things like giving them probabilities on a pitch by pitch basis for on base percentage. So as you know each pitch that on base probability will change. We were doing it in real time based on all the analytics that are in our system. We were doing pitch prediction to predict the type of pitch that would come next. We've now taken that into other areas as well and recently launched a soccer product outside the United States for all the European soccer leagues where we're doing probabilities of results
for soccer matches in Europe uh, and Asia. So uh, we think that the whole area of predictive analytics is one that we have a particularly strong feel for the models that we can build, and we think people are quite interested in it, both from a kind of game playing perspective and just uh, to, to understand better about what's likely to come. And, you know, it sort of gets to, um, I think, what Javi was saying earlier. There's nothing better in sports than people, than people having different opinions and arguing about it. And predicting what's going to come next is a big part of that. So we're excited about going in that direction. So what I'm going to show you next is the system that we launched a couple of years ago and is now in its second iteration. We've just, re we've just released the new platform for this system. And it, 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 I think that that's an important point because one of the things um, we've found is that you have to keep working on improving whatever you have as a baseline for, an for analytics and for tools. Technology changes, the ideas change in terms of what's important, and you have to keep iterating. We have a lot of dialogue back and forth with all the different people we work with at the clubs. We're constantly working within the 2,000 strong engineering group at Bloomberg to understand what technological changes we can bring into the system. And we've just now released our new platform, which is much faster. It allows people to work on mobile really any place with a much better system. It's much more efficient. The visualizations are better. And so I'm very pleased that we've just rolled this out. Uh, and one of the things that, as I begin to show you the system, um, I can tell you is that this system um, has in it all major league data that goes back to before 1900. It has all minor league data, it has international data, college data. Um, it has video, it has pitch by pitch data going back to 2006. Um, it has all the pieces that you need to run all the operations from front office perspective. And that was really our goal from the beginning, which was to give the clubs the best possible tools to do their job. And what they do with those tools is at the end of the day, one of the things that will distinguish success from not success. But at the end of the day, you want to have the best possible tools you can have. And that was our goal. So what we've done is build a one-stop shop where it's a fully integrated system, all of which talks to each other, very mobile, accessible anywhere. And to give you a sense of how it works, if you, I've loaded in here Tim Lincecum. Let me, this is better. So what you're looking at here is every pitch that Lincecum threw in 2012. Now if you switch tabs, because one of the real tri hallmarks of the, of the system is it has all kinds of different areas that allow the clubs to do their own, to do their work. So they, there are areas for scouting that go right from area scouts all the way up to the general manager. There are areas for data analytics, areas for video, and so forth. Now this is this is a very simple this is a very simple um, area which is just a pitch patterns area and all that this will show you is the different pitches that he, that Lincecum threw in 2012 broken down by the type of pitch. So against lefties he threw 51% fastballs, 23% changeups, and so forth. And over here on the other side against righties very close, 52% fastballs, but a lot more sliders, 27%, and fewer changeups. Right? But if you want to drill down. What you can do is filter this anyway. So if you want to see what he threw in the first inning, simply do this. And very quickly, we'll see that a lot more fastballs in the first inning. So 60% to lefties, 61% to righties. And if you now go out to the sixth inning, oops. you'll see that number change. And you'll be able to look at that however you want to look at it. Now that's very simple stuff. But what you're then able to do is look much more in depth at it. So this chart will show you the pitch sequence. So it shows that he does start guys off, lefties off with a fastball 58% of the time. We're now in the sixth inning. If you do get a fastball, there's a 54.5% chance you're going to see that again. And if you see it twice in a row, there is 54.2% chance you're going to see three in a row. But if he happens to start you off with a curveball, which is 15% of the time, what will you see next? Well, 
you then go into the outer ring in sequence. And you can then filter that the same way. So you can say, well, I would like to see what's, what's the case if there's a man on first, or what is the case when there are two out. And you can provide any filters you want, and you can pull up the information instantaneously. If you go to another tab, one we were on before, So what we're looking at now, which looks like a painting in a museum or something, is all of the pitches that Linsa come through in 2012. Down here is all the data associated with it. So we threw 3,616 pitches, and you have the pitch type, pitch result, and so forth. So of the pitch result of 3,616 pitches, you have the number of balls, the number of all strikes, called strikes, swinging strikes, and so forth. Now again, the strength of the system is the ability very quickly to filter it in ways that you can find most valuable as a club in your preparation for a series coming up when you're facing Lincecum or if you're Lincecum facing another hitter. So let's say we want to see what Lincecum throws on three and two. So very quickly we can put that information there and now you see every three and two pitch that once it come through in 2012. So what did he throw? He threw 52% fa fastballs, 48% off-speed pitches. So well, I'd like to see what he threw on three and two um, late in the game. So you just find, or you, or you say with a, with a man on first. So. put a runner on first base, and now you'll find very quickly the data coming back that way. But a lot, a lot of the material is used to prepare for particular matchups. So if you are, if you're expecting to face the Dodgers and you're the Giants and you want to take a look at, just one second, um, what Lincecum has done against Let's say Matt Kemp. Put Kemp's name in here. And now in a second, we'll see every pitch that he threw to Kemp last year. So and what this will tell you is that um, he faced him nine times, eight official at bats, so there was one sacrifice, threw 39 pitches. Kemp did not get a hit, he struck out four times. Say, so, well, I'd like to see um, just those strikeouts pitches. So you come into this tab, you say just the strikeouts. And so that now calls up the four strikeout pitches. You can see, if you can see from there, which I think you can, that they almost all, they all came on pitches low and inside. That's how we struck them out. Um, if you could see the color coding from there, you can see that there was one fastball and three off-speed pitches. And then if you want to take it to the next step and actually see what those pitches look like, you highlight them and they're all tagged to the video. So this will be a low and inside strike three. Got him. One of the nice things about the bridge system is set up Lynn's is that it allows you to look. pause it at any point. So you can look at a release point. You can also um, do it in slow motion so you can freeze frame it and right where you want to do it. So this is just a snapshot, of course. I can't spend all night showing you the system. And one thing I was going to show you was um, because I really enjoy, and particularly with people in this room like me who love the history of baseball, the system has every player going back to before 1900. In fact, maybe I'll just finish up by showing you one thing because I do really like that part. So you can put in a player like Honus Wagner, and you can go back 
very far and get his whole career history. You can see how he did in 1897 when he was playing at Louisville and so forth, which, you know, I just love sort of digging around this sometimes. But part of it that, uh, part of it that I really like is that, you know, we, we don't distinguish, so he says born February 24th, 74. Of course, we don't say 1874, so uh, we need to uh, improve that part of the system. Anyway, um, it's, uh, it's um, really been a pleasure to work with the clubs as we begin to get better at this, at this work. I mean, Bloomberg spent many, many years building up a tremendous expertise in the financial markets. We know we're just getting started in sports, but we think with the tools we're building and the technology that underpins all the things that we have, we're able to provide some real value to the industry and also provide some really interesting and fun and engaging products for consumers. We look forward to getting your input. Um, I hope Stats Insights is something that you'll check out. And if, if you're interested in writing and being part of it, we welcome you to join us. I'm now going to turn it over uh, to Jerry Depoto. It's been a pleasure starting to work with the Angels and having, um, having them tell us what our system can do and what we can do with our system to really help them with their operations. We look forward to working with them extensively this year on that. Jerry, it's all yours. Thank you. And thanks, Bill. You know, I've been dealing with Bloomberg now for a handful of years, going back to my time in the scouting department with the Diamondbacks and watching these products grow and evolve. It's been fascinating to watch. I heard some murmuring in back of me when Bill was playing with the, the wheel up here, and it really is fascinating the things, the, the, the different avenues you can explore in, in dissecting both the subjective and objective information available to you. But like Bill said, what this, what this vehicle provides is a one-stop shop, and it does for us as an organization. I know there are many other clubs in the league that use it as such. We'll use it for our series-to-series -series advanced scouting program, so we're getting ready to face the, the Rangers or the A's or you know, now the Houston Astros, and, and we will prep for that series with information we're drawing, both the data and the, the visual from these, the, the, the Bloomberg system to show our players. We'll be able to take it and carve it down into a, a small presentation to hand off to our players or even in small booklets that can sit on the bench as cheat sheets. Because as you might imagine with this kind of volume of information, it's really hard as a player on the field. And I'm not so far removed from it that I can't remember. Really tough to remember all of it. Yeah, maybe Jason Veritek's the only one I've ever seen who can process all of it. But, you know, we take that and we carve it into usable uh, information for the players during the course of a game. We'll store our, our scouting database here, and it covers international players, 16, up to, back to 15s, 15, 16, 18, 19-year-olds from outside the United States, or the amateur scouting database, the professional scouting database. You know, when all is said and done, we'll have scouted somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 players on an annual basis. And, and that's, that's worldwide, and, and that's not counting multiple reports that are written on certain of those individuals. So it, obviously it's a monstrous amount of information, and that one-stop shop includes our player development reports. So we've got six affiliates, six full-time affiliates, plus a Dominican Summer League program, and each of those minor league affiliates will play a minimum of 144 games. The DSL will start cranking up about June the 1st, and on a nightly basis, our pitching coach, our hitting coach, and our manager at each of those affiliates are required to file a report on what happened that day. And, you know, it's, it's much more of a, of a I, I would guess it's a, you term it subjective, I guess it's balancing the objective and subjective in certain ways. But we'll have each of them, and from the, from the 25th man on a roster to, to the top prospect in the organization, just give a detailed breakdown of each of his at-bats, his innings pitched, how he sequenced those pitches. And we can then take that information and separate it into, again, usable information that allows us to make good decisions on when to push that player forward in, in his progression, when he may be ready for, for a major league call-up, what might be the flaw, what have we found that he's struggling with. And, and sometimes that can happen when you're tracking you know, pitch quality, the, the lack of ability to throw a third pitch for a strike. You know, it'll start to show up over time. And I think that's the value of tracking these numbers and, and using certain metrics is that it allows you to develop a trend and, and eyeball where players are 
in their development, whether it be at the minor league levels or, or certainly in the major leagues. So it, this really has turned out to be a one-stop shop for us where we can, look at, we can look at subjective information, objective data, and in addition to video and, and at the push of a button. If 10, 12 years ago, we're sitting here and it, it, pulling up baseball cube, baseball reference, you, you've got six different windows open in order to research one player while you're trying to watch video on another screen because you can't manage it all on your desktop. Now all we have to do is push a button, and it's right there for us. And each of these, each of these systems is custom designed for the team that's using them. So if, if we want a, a little bit more of a sexy boutique stat or something as, as simple as the back of a baseball card, we can generate that in the touch of a button. And, and whatever we can think of in, in our creative minds, Bloomberg has been very capable in regard to their ability to deliver to the clubs. So yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a great tool. It's, it looks really cool. It's very usable. And I know, you know for us daily, we use it. And I'll just give you a, a for instance, if we're, we're sitting in the draft room, it's the end of May, early June, we're going through our prep for the annual June draft. And, and you're looking at high school and college players. You get into the 18th round of the draft, a draft in which historically 1,500 players are going to go off the board. And it, you're now down to a very small number of appealing players who you can't really uh, separate because you have the same role grade or number on those players overall, their value to the organization. But we can, we can simply touch a button and say, give me all right-handed pitchers who we, through our own subjective opinion, have graded out with a plus curveball. Give me all the pitchers remaining on the board who we deem to have a plus curveball, and they'll, they'll filter through and we'll see six names pop up. And all of a sudden now we've got a, we've got a cue to the side that we can say, here's the six guys we're focused on. And shockingly enough, inevitably, whenever you do that, four of them go off the board, just like kickers in fantasy football. So, you know, the, the information that we're able to store here helps us every day. We use it in so many ways throughout the baseball operation. And we incorporate so many people. This is, these are trainers, medical staff, coaches, man, managers at each level, front office members, the major league staff downstairs. We've got a team of, of video assistants. We have, we have a group of five people upstairs who pour through this information daily. We have one individual whose loan responsibility every day of the season is to make sure that the, the advanced scouting report is prepared for that day and that the cheat sheets are available for the players on the bench. So it's, it really is a fascinating tool to use. Uh, I know the, the video package is my favorite. I mean, I, I love digging through the, the history of Hunnis Wagner's statistics as much as anybody. Believe me, anybody who knows me will, will tell you that's true. But being able to pull up the video and on demand just say, show me every slider that Jared Weaver threw in 2011 when his slider had, had extreme success rates. And what's the difference between it and 2013 when, when we're seeing a, an early trend that says maybe not. You know, not that that's happening. That's a hypothetical <laughs> example. Uh, we'll use Jerry DePoto's name in, in lieu. Uh, we'll dial it back some. But we're able to, to take that and, and teach, ourself, teach ourselves lessons as well as introduce it to the player and introduce him to the video. You know? And we have had all these different elements available to us through the years, but we always had to go we always had to go to so many different stops along the way, whether it be the video room downstairs, the, the different websites to pull up the information, the different, the, the different carriers and servers who would provide us with, and sometimes it was as many as four different companies that were providing us with the information we needed, and Bloomberg has been able to pull all that together. And it, it is a fascinating uh, piece of, of equipment for us to use, and we're still exploring the, the outer limits of it, and I'm sure we'll change it along the way. So that's about it for me, Bill. I don't know. I'll sit over here and yap when you want me to. So we, want, we really wanted you know, this session to be as much uh, about questions that you all would have about, um, and I suspect you'll have more for Jerry than for me about how the angels um, approach the whole area of analytics. But uh, we wanted to open up to questions as much as we could. Uh, my question is just, uh, what do you see uh, being the next progression in technology for scouting uh, in the future? 
Is that for me or for? Uh, it's for for I mean either, but uh, I guess it would be for for Mr. Devoto. Yeah, I don't think you know. I don't know that we can automate it any more than we already have because you know the essence of scouting is to take what you see and couple it with what you know. If I, for any that were here at the, the conference last year, it, it was a major point of stress on my part. And it's something that, that myself, colleagues, we've talked about for the better part of the last decade and a half. Decade and a half. The live eye does mean something. We can't, we can't create a system in which we take that out of play. But what we can do is, and I'll bring up an example, and I'm sure it's a story that most of, or all of you have heard, is you know Kirk Gibson when he hit the the famous game-winning home run off Dennis Eckersley in the 1988 World Series, a uh, great scout and, and terrific baseball man by the main, name of Mel Didier was serving as the Dodgers' advanced scout through that postseason, and walked in prior to the start of the '88 World Series and sat down with Gibby, who had a long relationship going back to Mississippi, Michigan State with. He said, I'm telling you, partner, you're going to get in a 3-2 count with Dennis Eckersley, and as sure as I'm standing here, he's going to throw you a backdoor slide, which is exactly what happened. It took Mel Didier 30 to 40 days of tracking the Oakland A's to, to come up with that opinion or form that opinion. We're now able to do it with the tools that Bill just showed you with the click of a button. But you don't want to take away from the scout that's sitting there, largely because, as, you, as and I wasn't here to hear the entire conversation with Brandon and Javi, but when you go down to a major league clubhouse the first time you tell them that something is absolutely true and it doesn't happen you just lost the credibility and, and this whole system blows up and you're starting over from scratch so from from the next layer of technology we always have to remember to take all the different technological advances that we've we've accrued through time and always combine them with the with the human opinion because it's very important particularly in regard to the credibility you get in the major league clubhouse the only thing I would add to um, what Jerry said is that from a technology standpoint and scouting, there are areas we do think that um, there may be opportunities. So for example, um, video at the high school level, uh, which sometimes is important, we think there can be more of it and it can be uh, systematized and also normalized so that it's useful. Um, you know, players play in baseball and in other sports as well, but I mean across very different leagues, levels of competition. Are there ways to normalize that with metrics and analytics that you can look, look at? And we're looking at all those things to see it. But I would, I would more than second what Jerry finished with, which is that all the data in the world um, can be very valuable, but it is not the 100% solution by any stretch. And one thing that I know is that you know, we can say that the probability of something happening may be 98.9%, you know, and it may be that day when lightning strikes and the most amazing upset happens and you know you didn't pick what's going to happen all you can do is say here are the probabilities and then people have to work from there uh, Jerry um, starting with you the, there's so much data here you just get so much data and I mean you can filter through it and all that but there's just so much of it how do you guys work through all of that because there's only more coming how do you guys find what's important to you and and get away from the stuff that you just because you can't get to obviously to all of it well, for the most part, when we go, when we jump in the swimming pool, we know what we're looking for. So uh, when we when we head in there and we know what we're looking for, it makes it all the easier to find that. And we've got a really smart group of people that pour through this every day. And I'll I'll, I'll just yell something out the door. Hey, somebody tell me what pop pop pop, and and they'll produce that information very quickly. And in some cases, it's before I can finish the sentence. And Jonathan Strangio will walk into my office. There you go. So it it. Part of it is just, it's a road map, you know, the, and the, the Bloomberg allows us the, the ability to leave a trail of breadcrumbs that where we can find a player, we can find uh, something in the player's background or how he was trending through the minor leagues. You know, a big thing for us from an analytics standpoint is, is cross-referencing player's age and level and performance, you know. And not the easiest thing to do because, again, it, it's, it's not 100% foolproof. And you, but when we cross-reference that, there will be different elements we look at. And now that, you, now that you have available to you, you have ground ball rates in the minor leagues, things that were not available so many years ago. And we can come up with, you know, for instance, this year as a ball club, we're looking for different ways that we can accent and augment our major league club that fit within the context of, of our roster. 
And we started thinking about all the different elements. It's our roster. It's not just our roster. It's our ballpark. It's our environment. It's our, it's our relative weather. And, and we, started, we started expanding our horizons or expanding our applicants pool in what we were looking for because all too often we, we sit and we evaluate or we assess a player in a vacuum. And from the club's perspective, we're not doing that. We're evaluating their, or assessing them in context. And just like everybody in this room, I'm more apt to sit there and evaluate in a vacuum. And here over the last couple of years is the first time I really started to consider, you know, a more uh, context-based line of thinking when it, when it applies to putting together a major league roster. Why wouldn't you use all those different factors in gathering your information? And, and again, you know, for the most part, and just to wrap it up, I know it was a lengthy answer, which I'm prone to doing from time to time. I, I, to wrap it up, when we go into the, the pool, we generally know what we're looking for, and then it's just a matter of, of trusting the smart people to go find it because the information is there. Yeah, Bloomberg is one of the premier organizations in, in uh, collecting and or making use for analytics and big data. Uh, they've proven that in the financial world where the Bloomberg terminal is ubiquitous. I mean, there are probably tens of thousands of those out there. Every, everyone at... 340,000 to be exact. Okay. <laughs> I'd often wondered. Uh, the, but everyone at Goldman Sachs has one. Every hedge fund manager has one. Every financial analyst has, has one. There, there are 140 market that supports 140,000 of them. This seems much more restricted market. What is Bloomberg's target audience for this? I mean, there are, you know, a very limited number of major league clubs, a limited number of European soccer clubs. So what is your target audience? Well, we approach the sports industry really looking at it in two ways. One is what we can do for professionals in the industry, like the system that uh, we've been looking at. Uh, and also what we can do for fans and for consumers, uh, and even as we're starting to do in Europe um, for people in markets where it's legal who wager on sports. So um, our goal is really to provide the most compelling, interesting, insightful um, analytics for anyone who is um, involved in one way or another in the sports world, as I say, as a fan, as a professional, and others. So this kind of system that we've been looking at, um, it's you know, hopefully very useful to the 30 major league clubs. Um, it's, there's a version that we make available to broadcasters so that they can help um, entertain and inform their audience. Um, we even have a, an iPad version that um, a lot of players use, which is very video focused. So we try to, we try to create different versions for different professional uses in order to make um, you know, something that's both helpful to people and good business for us. But then the other side of our business is also a consumer side. So we have very um, strong uh, fantasy tools for baseball and for fantasy football. And we now have very strong predictive analytics products for people who are fans and are interested in knowing that Manchester United may have a 35% chance of winning this week against whoever they're playing and that their time of possession compared to their opponent is X. All kinds of really interesting statistics and insights. And we expect to do that for sports throughout the world and throughout the whole spectrum. So when you start putting together you know, all the sports and consumer and predictive pieces and all the professional um, systems that we can build, it's a very big potential market. And we don't need to get all of it, but we'd like to. But we would, um, you know, we really believe that this is a great market for Bloomberg because one of the things that you all in this audience have shown is that really diving into a sport and pulling out interesting data and statistics and analytics is becoming increasingly a part of the fabric of sports. And we think that that's spreading to other sports, and we're going to be right there helping people do it. Here or somebody else? Or, or question, question for each of you. Um, Bill, you mentioned you showed us data pre-1900. Is that your own data, or are you getting it from RetroSheet, Stats LLC? We have, we have a comprehensive partnership with Major League Baseball Advanced Media uh, for all of our data and for uh, video as well. We also supplement that with data from other sources. One, one of the sort of 
um, hallmarks of Bloomberg from the financial side and really all the different areas in which Bloomberg operates is that we get as many reliable data sources as we can to bring into the system and then we process them, analyze them, make them available in different ways. Um, but our core um, baseball data comes from MLB Advanced Media and that's, and that's where the uh, historical data is coming from. And Jerry, you mentioned uh, Jason Veritek there briefly, but this is also new in terms of being available to the player. What kind of reaction do you get from guys? Do some of them just take to it right away? Do others not? How do you really relate to this to the player, even if it is just in a pamphlet? What have you noticed? You know, every player is different. And at, if you provide this information for 25 players, 25, 25 aren't going to absorb all of it. 25 aren't going to want to. Uh, you may have 20 of those 25 are video guys, and they like to they like to watch the video. They like to get the visual picture of facing that hitter or pitcher. Uh, it may be something that we do internally in the clubhouse. We may take we may take it and put it on a on a reel and just play it over and over in the clubhouse, so that uh, the guy they're absorbing it without even knowing they're absorbing it because they're seeing these guys. You know, most of them do care about the matchups. Like Javi alluded to toward the tail end of the meeting up here earlier, uh, you want to know where the hot zones are, where the cold zones are, and, and what kind of success or failure this guy has had against you. Lack thereof, I suppose, is a better way to put it. And, and players, almost 100%, will go look at that information, particularly as it applies to them. And if you're providing it, they will look. You know, if, if, for instance, you know, player A has faced hitter X 40 times, there's a little bit of a story to tell there. And they will go look, and they're going to find out. And if now you have a vehicle that can, that can condense information and break it down to how you handled this guy ahead in the count, behind in the count, what did he hit off you, what was the, where are the hot zones for you? Because every pitcher might be different, you know. My fastball at 92 miles an hour may play different than his. And... I think most players want all the information they can get to make a decision, but there's always going to be an element on a team that says, ah, I'm just going to go out and play. Question, question here for Mr. DePoto, to your right, over here. You just mentioned something about not actually trying to find something to replace the actual eye. I would imagine that was referring to your actual scouts. But having all of this at the tip of your, you know, just off your fingertips, how much does it alleviate the pressure from the front office, from the scouts? It actually does replace some of the actual work, you know, but is it for the better of the organization or do you, you know, you go away from the actual judgment of, you know, professional scouts who have been doing this for years and years? Uh, again, like I said earlier, we as an organization, and I believe we as an industry, will never entirely automate or work solely off of, of pure technology. It's a, it's a game played by human beings. It's hard to predict what human beings will do. It's also hard to, to qualify why a certain pitch works. It, it's hard to qualify or quantify uh, why a, a, a level of success, why does, why does you know, so-and-so who throws 85 miles an hour with what appears to be a rolling breaking ball to the naked eye strike out 11 and a half per nine? Uh, I, do, I don't know that the eye can tell you, but the numbers are telling you that it happens. And then there's other instances where the, the player who hits you know, 245 with a 315 on base but can play seven different positions on the field is wildly versatile, you know, is a, an above average runner and a terrific clubhouse guy. You never want to take that away from this game. He may not fit on every team, but he fits on most if, if in context he's placed in the right position. So I, I don't know that what we, the best way to describe how you marry technology and the human eye or the, the analytics, the, the metrics that we will use and the human eye is that you're always, you're always creating a balance. And if nothing else, what you're always trying to accomplish is the credibility of the answer because nothing is certain. That we've learned in baseball. Nothing is certain. Therefore, you can't walk into a major league clubhouse and ask them to sell out to one piece of information because on the 0.01% chance that that goes wrong, you'll never have that player's trust again because he was embarrassed on a public stage. And that's, that's the way the human mind works. Uh, Mr. DePoto, um, how much does, I'm just trying to get this question correct. Um, how much, when you're looking at players in your minor league system, 
how much do you not look at the statistics because there are other factors in play? It could be like in the PCL, you know, as a hitting environment, whereas the Southern League may be a pitching environment, plus you have your age and just other things. How, how much are statistics really maybe not looked at as important as other things? The, the answer to that one is never. I mean, we look at it all the time, every time. You know, how much it plays into the decision is going to be weighed the, the level of maturity for the, the individual. Maybe it, it could be a psychological profile that we've done, which is another element that we can introduce. It could be the, the player's age for the level of play. It could be his general body type. You know, there's, there's a difference between a 17-year-old kid that we sign out of, out of New Jersey and a 17-year-old kid we sign out of Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Relative nutrition, strength training, how strong are they? You know, bodily, they're physiologically, they may be the same age, but from a maturation standpoint, not so much. So all of these things are things that you have to consider. It's, it, it's the human condition, and that's why it can't just simply be one touch of the button. We have to balance. Again, I call it what you see and what you know. You know, we know the data is true. This is how it all works out. But, but what we see every day affects how we use the, 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 just the, the, the application of that data, how we, and we may apply it differently in certain circumstances, like you're talking about. Uh, I have a question here uh, about that 17-year-old from New Jersey. Uh, I grew up in South Jersey. In fact, my high school was in the same league with Vineland, and it's beyond backwater. Uh, they probably play 20 games a year. So how did you have enough data to be able to see that this guy really was that good? I think the answer is, and, and welcome, I am from Tom's River, New Jersey, just up the road. Uh, used to wipe Vineland out. But the, <laughs> the answer to the question is you don't, and that's why you need the human eye. There, there is, a, we'll, we'll use, we'll use the, the, that example as a case in point, you can't draw up enough data or, or even statistical information on a high school hitter and then make any sense of it. Because now you're getting into some really iffy questions with what's the level of competition? Where are they? Because there is a big, I can tell you having played high school baseball in central New Jersey, big difference when you go watch a game in, in Southern California. So it's a, it, it, you're not looking at an apple and an apple. But some of the great players in the history of the game have come from cold weather, in the Northeast, so you you don't want to forsake that, but you do have to trust how we do our how we do our business from a more subjective scouting opinion. This may be a little bit off of the, the Bloomberg issue per se, but uh, have people started quantifying scouts? Yes, and many teams have, and you know we've done it. I know during my time with the Diamondbacks. What you'll do, one of the things that, that we introduce to our scouting reports, every team will have a different grading system, a different language they use when they're talking about a player. It could be, an, it could be a letter grade, it could be a number grade, it could be a word. Uh, we choose to use a little of each. We have a number grade and we associate it with a probability. Bill talked about probability in predicting you know, future performance, wins, losses, etc. We ask our scouts to both grade the player and then, and then with their own subjective opinion, give us the level of probability using words. So we have a number and a word. We're then able to take that word and in a, in a measure or in order just to create debate in a, in a draft room or as we're having discussions around trade deadline time or in the off season months, create debate based on what that scout's level of probability is on the player achieving his upside. And back to the point we just made in the last question, his performance coming through the minor leagues. So again, it's taking all the information you can get, coupling them, and, and having, essentially, it's a, it's a system of checks and balances so that when you're making decisions, you used all the information you could access and you used it in the appropriate way. A uh, couple questions. Uh, one for Mr. DePoto. Um, you just talked about uh, a question ago, uh, how the Northeast plays into this um, so one question I have is, how do you factor what the scout's uh, opinion is? Um, and the scout might have the opinion that this is a player who's not getting the chance to develop by playing year round. Um, how do you avoid double counting that with 
looking at the report and um, just having this system right in front of you, short of just obviously asking the scout, um, is there a way around that? Uh, and the second question is for Bill. Um, does this uh, allow you uh, as a team to go in and look at comparable players um, and help you for, if you just want to look at finders, find, say, players who had 10 war in their age 20 season last year, um, things like that. As to the last question, we have a whole area. I mean, we could truly have spent hours going through all the different areas of the program, as you might imagine. But one of the areas is a whole peer comparison area where um, it's um, uh, possible for uh, a club to put in the different attributes that it wants to see. I mean, let's say that it's looking for a, um, you know, to pick, uh, pick up a, a middle infielder. Um, because somebody's gone down and they want to find somebody with particular characteristics, you can put those characteristics in. The system will immediately pull up the ones who have those characteristics. You can weight the characteristics. So if you want to customize the statistic and, you know, underweight or overweight something like stolen bases or, um, you know, pitches per plate appearance or whatever you happen to want to really emphasize. Um, and then uh, you can look at all those players and you can get all of their data about things like their time of service and how many options there may be. So you can get all the information specifically as to each player and all of that can be pulled up um, instantly. And I think that that really is a big part of the goal of what we're trying to achieve, which is to um, make the whole operation more efficient, which then can free people like Jerry and his staff to do more and more work um, on other things so that because they're able to get to the information that much more quickly. And as to the first question, I got to be honest with you, I didn't quite understand what you were asking in relation to the cold weather having its effect. But it's going to sound like a broken record on that one. There, there's probably a reason why, as you look back through the, the history of the Major League Baseball draft, it's, it's very Florida, Texas, California centric. It's, there's baseball played year round. The players are a little uh, more advanced at 17, 18 years old than the players in the Northeast, not uncommon. And it doesn't mean that ultimately when, when their growth is complete that the player from the Northeast may not be better, but that player is associated with a much higher degree of risk. And part of the business that we're in is managing risk. If I had to point out what is the most important thing I do every day, it's to manage the risk. So when we're out there drafting, we've got the number one pick in the country, and we have the option of choosing an outstanding toolsy player from Southern California who has performed at a high level and a similar model from the Northeast, unless there's some great physical separator. There, most clubs have shown through time. I can't tell you how we'd react. We've done fairly well in the Northeast lately. But the, the idea being that most clubs have often opted for the warm weather player, mostly because you see him more. And at the, at the end of the day, the level of comfort with the player you draft is just how well you know him. Did you sit down with the player and his family? Again, things that you need to, to you have to introduce uh, or humanize the, the decision. Did you meet with the family? Did you get to know uh, the kid? How, what kind of student is he? Is he sharp? Does he have aptitude? Because you're going to see wildly talented and gifted players from all over the world. You know, and in every quarter and in every weather spot in the United States that I achieve with, with marginal tools or fail with, with outstanding tools. And unfortunately, I don't know that the data available to us at, for, at the high school level is significant enough to be able to determine whether that's going to be a positive or a negative six and eight years down the line. Well, I also went to high school in South Jersey in a group four, four school. Um, and I always thought that, uh, and my recollection may be imperfect at my advanced age, but I always thought that uh, Mike Trout was from Millville. He is. And not violent, in other words, not violent. Yeah, he, he mentioned violent. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, I just wanted to check that out. So when considering how scouts grade players, obviously since scouting is subjective, not every scout looks at you know the same grade exactly the same. There's slight variations. Is there a way to kind of neutralize 
the Scots grades so that you can compare two separate Scots grades in the same scale? Not perfectly, but one of the benefits of having, again, weighted decisions. So if we're putting a, a role or, or I guess a ceiling on a player, what is, what is this player's ceiling? What do you believe he will achieve? And on the standard scale of 20 to 80, if you think this player has 80 future potential, what's the real chance that that's going to happen? And, and you'll, you'll find out, at least in, in, I guess, you can trisect your scouting department. You'll find the conservative, you'll find the super aggressive, and then you'll find the guy who sits right on the fence. And if nothing else, if you can determine which of that genre that scout sits in, you'll know what you're looking at in the evaluation, which is why we introduced that element. And then we can essentially take a, a, a scout's tendencies or trends in how he grades players, and, and it allows us to make, it, at least make a, a better assessment of what that means, that number means. Oh yeah, just like, just like Bill was talking about with this system, having data going back to 2006 and, and research data going back to, to two centuries, essentially. You know, we, we'll track our department, we'll keep a paper trail of what, the player that we sign and draft, we will have the information from that kid from the first time we saw him to the day he retires or walks out the door on the organization. And we'll do that with, with every player in every other organization as well. You know, we're keeping tabs. Keep the keys to the car because you never know when that guy's going to walk through your door. You know, I see it's 7.30, and I'm sure everybody here is uh, eager to get the reception. I just want to, uh, again, thank Sabre for the uh, opportunity to do this and the conference that they've created, and thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you, and thanks, Jerry.